asked our uh, speaker how she'd like to be introduced, and she just said, open source developer or contributor and software developer. So I'm going to respect her decision to be known as such. <laughs> um, I'll give her a chance to do her presentation, and then we'll have some question time at the end. So by all means, take it away. I think everybody here is interested in what you have to say. Okay, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so we, I'm going to give a talk on deploying and managing Python with Kubernetes. So before we start, a little bit about me. I'm a software engineer, aeronautical engineer to be. And I contribute to open source. I'm an author of Python 2 and 3 compatibility, a book uh, published by a press. And I'll be doing some Python, Python stuff, PyPy stuff with IBM early next year. That's a little bit about me. So um, today, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just love to talk about containers, why we need them, and how we can orchestrate them, and how you can, we can manage uh, a Kubernetes cluster with Python. So a, a few rules. Um, so I prepared the talk for 45 minutes, so I did take care of Q&A. So in case we run out of time, I'll just, you can write me your questions or to send your questions to my email. In case we have time, I'll, we shall take a few questions. Okay, so um, we've come a long way into deploying, deploying systems. And uh, early in that day, deploying applications was an event, sort of like a ceremony. And after deployment, whenever system admins needed to go for a vacation, they did that, literally. And uh, it's because developers claimed everything worked <laughs> on their machines. And this is what uh, sysadmins had to say. Say, works on my machine one more time. And it was an anthem before, and be just because of the challenges we've always had. So deployment has come a long way. There was a time we had three options, and currently, we still have three options of deploying applications. Uh, the first is a physical machine. Uh, another option is a virtual machine or containers, like we we'll discussed today. So in the era of physical machines, what happened is we typically host one application on a given host, on a given server, for fear that if we had another one, maybe we would mess up libraries or something. So in case to ensure we had things right, we would typically host one application per host. But that was very resource-consuming. Uh, you'd find that maybe your, your application needed a few resources, but then uh, you had to install a two kilobyte application on uh, a, a machine that has maybe 16 gigabytes of RAM. That was resource, wasting resources, in short. But we did that so that we could have uh, high levels of availability for our applications. Then later, with the concept of virtual machines, we could virtualize our hardware and be able to run a couple of applications on the same host. So what we would basically do is install guest operating systems and then have our different applications run on the different operating systems. So guest operating systems. So here we solved one problem. We would be able to use our computing resources uh, well, like consistently. That means we made use of our expensive computing resources. And then virtual machines came with a problem because of the issue of we, could, we had to reboot the guest OS every time we wanted to launch a particular instance of our application. So it worked fine. We saved a few, a few, a few pounds or a few dollars, but we, had, we could launch, it would take a couple of years to launch uh, an application. Then we came, there came containers and uh, with containers, we virtu we're basically virtualizing the OS, and uh, we're not installing any guest OS on top of our host, but we are still able to abstract, run a couple of applications at the same host, but still abstract the application from the environment in which it runs. And how do we do this? Just like in normal terms, uh, ordinarily, 
you, you may use a container to hold different things. You can have the same bag and you're carrying milk and sugar and something else. But if you put it in a container, they'll all reach and disturbed because they have a logical packaging around them. So that's the same concept we are using in software. We package an application with all its dependencies so that it runs abstracted from the environment in which it's going to run, destination. Because the fact of the matter is software changes environments, changes from development to test and then to production. So that uh, we are sure that our applications will run reliably from development to production. So uh, the idea is we virtualized the host OS, but uh, as opposed to virtual machines, we also gained performance, better performance, because containers, uh, we can easily boot them faster than booting an application that's running in a virtual machine, because again, of the concept of a guest OS. So that was a tick uh, for us, but what do we, why would we even care about containers? One is productivity. Care about, we just care about running our, uh, writing our code and then using code to even specify our infrastructure. And then we just move uh, what our application to another environment and we are sure it will run reliably and undisturbed. But, but also we gain from portability uh, because uh, especially the concept of the cloud right now, we want to move around software without worrying of many other things. And then scaling, when you containerize your application, I do not want to say that with containers we get maybe automatic scaling, but within them we get the ingredients to scale. They give us the ingredients to easily scale with other beta platforms. But like Kelsey Hightower once said, uh, con the whole concept about containers just ushers us into using robust platforms like Kubernetes. Like I gave one example, within containers, we are able to have the ingredients to easily scale, whether you have microservices or whatever, we easily scale, but also make use of good platforms like Kubernetes, like we we'll talk about today. So, containerization is a simple, is a very simple concept. So, uh, there are very many different runtimes or tools we can use for containerizing applications. But today, I'll talk about Docker because I mean, I'm told if you don't. Uh, said Docker in a technical talk, and it's no longer a talk. So we'll talk about Docker today. So the thing is, uh, you just need to create something called a, a Docker file, and you specify uh, everything your application needs to run in a Docker file. And then from the Docker file, we'll be able to create the image. And from the image, we create a container. So think about an image as a blueprint from which we create containers. So just like a class, we can create many instances of our image, which are containers. So we can create many instances of our application from one image, container image. So in Python wise, given a simple application, that's a, a simple Flask application, Hello World application. And if you wanted to containerize this, we just create a Docker file. That's a very simple Docker file that could manage that code. So we specify a base image, which is an <coughs> operating system. So uh, I'm just using Alpine, but you could use maybe an Ubuntu OS or a base of your, of your choice. And then the rest is we are copying the requirements file. Of course, the application will have a requirements file where we put all our dependencies and then we create a working directory. Those are basically just, uh, that's Docker syntax. So you can always look it up. And, but at its core, we are installing all the libraries, all the software our application runs, and then we even have an entry point where we actually run the application. So that's all uh, we need to do to co containerize an application, create a Docker file. Then you use the Docker client to build your image, your Docker image. A simple command, docker build, then the image name, then you can run your image. So since the Docker file has all instructions for installing dependencies and even running application, 
you can note that we can't decouple a container from the application that runs inside of it. So when we, whenever we start a container, we indirectly also start the application that runs inside of it. Okay. So, but uh, that's not all. I think it's a very simple way. Uh, the whole concept of containerization is very simple, but that's not all. If you're use, going to use containers the, uh, the good way, at least in production, you need to uh, note a few things. One is we we'll need to create small images. And there are very many concepts around creating small images because, and you can find them all over, uh, uh, Docker con at DockerCon 2017, there's a lady called Abby Fuller. She gave a good talk on how to create small images. And small images are good because they, we, get, we gain from greater performance. Because uh, when, we when we work with containers, we are ev uh, we're ever pushing and pulling container images from a registry of some sort. So when we have a smaller image, performance is key. But also security-wise, because smaller images have a small surface area of attack. Yeah, so, and I won't go through all the concepts of how to create small images, but uh, it's something I want to impress you to look, to look it up because of its benefits. But then also, you can, we need to unit test the container images. Um, when, it, when we create uh, an image, it runs in production at some point as well. So we have tested our code, so that's a tick. But also, we need to unit test the, co the image itself. Now, this is a new concept. And again, I'm not going to go deep into it, but Google released a framework early this year called the Google Container Structure Test Framework. And you can make good use of it. This is a, just the basic syntax of how we unit test a container image. But what we are looking for is for its structure and assuring it's in shape. Yeah. Just like we unit test code, we also need to unit test our container images before they go to production. So it's also something you can look it up. And so, yeah. So in summary, containers are packaging for applications, giving us productivity, portability, and scaling. You create a container by having a Docker file for your application. Then you use the Docker client to build the image. Uh, and it will, the, the, that step of building images will use instructions from your Docker file, and then you can run your container with the Docker client still. So in summary, that's it. So, so we solved one problem. Uh, we no longer say the anthem, we, st we stopped uh, singing the anthem of it works on my machine, and that's good enough. Uh, containers solved that. And then there is that last mile. What happens when we have many containers? And then if, if, there, if you have like two containers, then uh, there's no problem. But how, when you have 1,000 containers, the problem is how do we manage them? And then if you have containers, how will you scale them to meet the existing traffic? So of course, there are many ways, uh, rudiment, rudimentary ways, and then there are better ways of doing the same. So, Kubernetes com comes to our rescue. Kubernetes is just an orchestrator, a container orchestrator, and uh, we use it for managing uh, managing containerized applications. And so what basically happens is that contain, uh, Kubernetes helps us make deployments. A deployment is a, it's a unit how should I say, a unit of our application. And then with Kubernetes, we are able to, to monitor our application, uh, as in monitor the instances of our application that are down, so that maybe we get them up, or so that we ensure we have zero down, downtime. So just to ask a question, how many people have never had downtimes down, down times for their application? Liar, there's somebody there. <laughs> Okay, so yeah. Oh, maybe this morning because yesterday is still a long time. <laughs> yeah. So, so everyone has never had downtime, and that's why we need to Kubernetes. So Kubernetes will monitor all our instances and report on the 
And if it notices uh, an instance that's not up and running, it will automatically launch another for us. So what that means for us is that you can easily enjoy your vacation because uh, Kubernetes is managing some of the things that you would have been paged for. So, so what happens? What is a deployment? Like I said, it's, we specify an image from which we create a container, and then we also specify uh, the criteria, the requirements for, for running our container or for running the instances of our application. We specify the RAM, we specify storage, we specify CPU, and many other things. So about monitoring, uh, so Kubernetes will check the health of all our instances uh, everywhere, and it will report, but also, most importantly, it will auto-recover our nodes. So even in the case that you deployed a broken build, if it notices a broken build, it will revert back to a previously working version. Yeah, so that's about monitoring. But also, uh, with, with Kubernetes, we get scaling, like I said, uh, it, containers give us the ingredients. And then with Kubernetes, we're able to do scaling that's, first of all, sometimes automatic if you choose. And we can do cluster scaling where, uh, so in Kubernetes, we have a concept of nodes. And then nodes are like physical machines. And then, so if your traffic increases, we can basically increase the nodes automatically increase the nodes or the machines to handle the existing traffic. Or we can do horizontal pod scaling, where instead of increasing the machines, we create more instances of the application to meet the, the current traffic per se. Okay. So this is the architecture of Kubernetes. We have something called a client. It can be a command line client or something. And the client talks to something called the master. And like the name suggests, the master controls everything in the Kubernetes cluster. So uh, look at this whole setup like the Kubernetes cluster, and it has a master somewhere controlling all everything in the cluster. So the client talks to the master, and then the master will talk, uh, schedule the right nodes. Nodes are physical machines like computers or servers or something in anything compute of any kind, and uh, there is a registry. So the master will uh, assign workloads to the right nodes and everything. So like I said, clients, uh, they will just make calls to the master, which are API calls at its general level. And uh, the master, like the name suggests, will schedule and control things in the cluster. And uh, it has a uh, at its core, it will have an OS image and a container runtime like Docker or anything of, of your choice. And then it has something called the ETCD, which is like the single point of truth. It will have uh, it's like configuration to give the state of everything in the cluster. Yeah? So it's a single point of truth. So it will schedule workloads that come, that come in and assign the right nodes which nodes I'll talk about, which are physical machines, to run the workload uh, that, uh, that are available to be worked on. Uh, it will schedule and control many other things. And then the nodes are physical machines, and then they run, they run a supervisor D layer, which will, and underneath there we'll have, we, run a, we have an OS running Docker and a kubelet, which is an agent. Uh, the agent just reporting to the master about the status of nodes and everything. And then on the nodes, that's where we run the pods. And a pod, a pod is like a, a group of containers that like do the same thing. So a pod can have one or more containers. So that's, and then could be proxy responsible for networking in the, in the cluster and many other add-ons, DNS and everything. So the concept of the node that it's our worker machine that will work on our loads. And the worker machine is scheduled by the master. So um, that's the concept of how a Kubernetes cluster looks like. Has a client making requests to the master, and the master, master scheduling the nodes to work on the requests and controlling the cluster in everything. 
So what do you need to deploy, deploy your applications on Kubernetes? First of all, uh, the first requirement is your application should be containerized. So use Docker or anything of your choice. And then you'll create a deployment. Usually we specify this in IAML file of some sort, or you can use kubectl to achieve the same. Um, and then we'll need, uh, we'll need a service. Sorry, I need to fix my Okay, so after we've created a deployment file, which is a YAML, we'll need to create a service file, which is still a YAML. And what a service file does is expose uh, a deployment, which was uh, a given unit of our application. So this is how basically our, a deployment looks like. It's a YAML file. And the most important thing you need to note in a deployment file is that something like called kind. So you can, that variable called kind can have anything. But for a deployment file, Okay, for a deployment file, the kind is uh, deployment, and then we'll specify, uh, our, our, uh, we'll have um, some major data like the name, name and the namespace. We'll put some specifications. Uh, uh, notable is the replicas. Replicas are the number of instances you want uh, of your application that should exist in the cluster or that should be running in the cluster. Then we have container. You specify the container image uh, somewhere. You'll have volumes. You can use uh, any file system of choice uh, that's supported by Kubernetes. Yeah, so at its core, that's a sample of uh, an example of a deployment file. And then that's how we create a deployment using kubectl. Kubectl is it's a, a, a client that you can install to manage uh, your Kubernetes cluster. So if you wanted to create a deployment using kubectl, that's the command you'd use. And then after having a deployment file, the next thing is we need to expose our deployment using a service. So you still write a, a YAML, and this is an example of a service. And you notice this time, kind is service instead of deployment. And yeah, we we'll specify a couple of things we can specify a label and many other things. I think this is something you can find out, uh, you can read about on how to document service, uh, write service uh, files and everything. But still, you can still create uh, a service using kubectl, like it's a command line tool. Okay. So, um, so that's how we use Kubernetes. You just create a Deployment file, create a service file, and that's all you need to do. Uh, okay, and that's all you need to do. And so how do we scale? Like I said, uh, Kubernetes helps us scale very easily. So uh, the only th the, all you need to do is uh, specify the replicas, yeah? The, replica uh, the replication set, like how many instances of your application you want to, to run. For example, if you want three, that number would be instead of one, it would be like three or five or any number of your choice. So that's how we scale in, in Kubernetes. And depending on the resources we have, it will automatically uh, put the run your applications on whatever nodes are available in, your, in that cluster. However, you can use a concept of labeling to say maybe you want a particular instance uh, to run an instance on a given node as well. However, it's, uh, Kubernetes has the potential to automatically just place the replicas anywhere. It will just create the number you want and place them anywhere, as long as uh, your nodes can handle, the, can handle all the load uh, needed to run, uh, the applications need to run on them. So like I said, scaling is two-way. At times, we scale the physical machines themselves. At times, we scale the instances themselves which is auto-scaling. So another concept of Kubernetes is the rolling updates, where, uh, so if you deploy a, a new version of your application and it's broken, so what Kubernetes does is that it will, 
it will it will it will roll back to a version that's healthy and that's the concept of rolling updates and with rolling updates we are able to have zero upgrade downtimes because kubernetes hand, handles the the rollbacks for us so we we won't have any instance in time where application is down because there was a, a broken build uh, that was published to production but and that's you can use uh, kubernetes to do rolling updates like that so we can pass a new image uh, with a name and tag using that flag you can read more about how to do rolling updates uh, with kubectl so in summary kubernetes gives us scaling monitoring and zero the upgrade downtimes scaling automatically uh, in the cluster but also using pods monitoring and auto recovering our, our instances across our nodes of course giving us zero upgrade runtimes downtimes so um so that's all we have for kubernetes and then so i've told you that we can control a cluster using using kubectl however in python we also have a client that we can use to <coughs> find the status of uh, different things in our cluster so it's called the kubernetes python client so at its core is that we are writing code to find out about different things in our cluster find out how many nodes are active uh, how many nodes uh, do we have and how many how things are running so i will just show a demo here Can you come? I just need to play this. Play. Yeah. No, don't, no sound. Okay. So. That is playing. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's a small demo of how we use the Kubernetes uh, client. Um, So it's pip installable, so you can install it with pip. <coughs> yeah, just like any, any normal Python library, we import, uh, we require it and then use it in different ways and uh, so he's trying to access all the pods in a in a given cluster and uh, print them out to some point uh, they print the different properties or aspects of our pod a pod is, is just a group of containers somewhere in a cluster so instead of using kubectl you can just write python code for that so it will run for a few minutes So those are all properties in a given cluster, a given cluster somewhere. And so 
So he, here he's just trying to create uh, some things uh, using kubectl so he can use them. He can access them using the client, this other side. Okay, is, is my time up? Okay. Okay. Maybe we, you can just go into Q and A. It will still play in the background. So yeah. So that's all uh, about Kubernetes and containers and how we can use the you can, we can use uh, using Python. So I'll take some questions. Back here. Um, so, how does the rolling updates work under the hood? Does it does it add like an instance of the update behind the same load balancer as the target uh, as a target instance, and then like try to switch it over? Like, how does it work? Okay. So, uh, if uh, just uh, so, just imagine we had three instances. Uh, of an application running. So when a developer deploys a new version, what Kubernetes does is it does not replace all the instances at once. So it first replaces one. Then uh, as the others are still serving uh, requests. So if it's broken, it will just revert uh, that first uh, uh, instance that it had replaced. But if it, was, uh, if it worked perfect, then Kubernetes will go into the second instance and replace it with a new version. And if it, it still works fine, it will replace the third instance as well. Uh, like, do you, I don't get your question clearly. I was just wanting to ask, what do you think the benefit of using the API is? It looks like uh, using kubectl is much simpler and faster. Um, the benefit of using the client itself, other than kubectl, uh, maybe if you if uh, if you wanted to access uh, things in your cluster pragmatically, yeah, I would use the the API, the Kubernetes client, instead of kubectl. Because kubectl, you're just using that, uh, the terminal. But if you wanted to access anything in the cluster pragmatically, then the, the a client is better. Yeah. Unless you have other reasons. That's what I would think about. Yeah. Um, how does Kubernetes know if the upgrade was successful? Because I mean, it would test a Docker container. That would be fine. But how does it know your code's working? How does it know that your code is working? Yeah, how does it know if the upgrade was successful? Because you said it's taking one container down, upgrading it, then the second one, then the third one, the nodes. But how would it actually know if the upgrade was successful? Because it, it can test the container itself, but would it detect if there were syntax errors, stuff like that in your code, or if there are rolling upgrades? So, so at, this, at this point, I think you are running the container but the container will run your code at some point. So what Kubernetes will, will know later is that your application, will, if there was a syntax error, your application will just not run fine like at the end of the day. So it would be unavailable. So it won't point out the exact syntax error because at this point it's running. It's like a sandbox. The application is a sandbox. OK, <laughs> yeah. anybody else? Okay, in that case, I have exactly three things I can hand out for questions. So we had exactly okay. three questions. So I'll just sort of semi-randomly do it among the three questioners then. Yeah, just.
shirt for the one guy. And you that one. And you can have the voucher because personally I like your question best. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. We're like three minutes before deadline, so you have a little extra time to get to your next session, but don't dawdle too much. And thanks for your time. <laughs>